probably have plastic particles in your urine, stool, blood, and organs, so what can you do to reduce your exposure to microplastics if you feel so inclined? First off, to make sure we're on the same page, what are microplastics and nanoplastics? Microplastics are less than 5 millimeters in size, about the size of a sesame seed or smaller. Nanoplastics are much, much smaller than that, and certainly cannot be seen to the naked eye. These plastics do not biodegrade in the environment, instead they fragment into smaller and smaller pieces over time through environmental weathering. Problem is, they are everywhere, in oceans, rivers, soil, and even the air that we breathe. Microplastics have been detected as far south as Antarctica, as far north as the Arctic, at the peak of Mount Everest, and in the depths of the Mariana Trench. And yes, since they're in the soil and in the water, around where we grow our crops and raise our animals, they've made their way directly into our food supply. Researchers have detected microplastics in foods even including salt, seafood, steak, sugar, water, honey, milk, tea, alcohol, and many more. One study found microplastic particles in 88% of protein food samples across 16 types, including seafood, pork, beef, chicken, and also including tofu. Between 2017 and 2024, hundreds of articles on the health effects of exposure to microplastics were published. There's a lot of data conducted in vitro or in animal models, but high-quality human data is lagging behind. One study study of 23 human testes, as well as 47 testes from pet dogs, found microplastics in every single testicle. In that small study sample, they did find a negative correlation between plastic contents, like the amount of PVC and PET polymers, and the weight of the testicles, meaning that more plastic was associated with smaller testicles in this very small study. A separate study in the New England Journal of Medicine was a prospective observational study including 304 patients who were undergoing carotid endarterectomy. So they took out plaque from the blood vessels and looked for plastic particles in those plaques, and some people had them and others did not. They found that patients who had plastics had about a four and a half times higher risk for heart attack, stroke, or death. However, there's several critical reasons why it's not that simple. First, they did not control for socioeconomic factors like income, education, and so on. That means these observational data can't show any form of causal link between the plastics and the bad health outcomes. What could be happening is that some people with lower income might be exposed to higher levels of plastics in their foods and, separately, have increased risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Studies in human organoids have suggested toxic impacts after the addition of microplastic particles. Normally, lab studies are done using cells grown in regular flasks, either the cells in a single adherent layer on the bottom of the flask, or some different types of cells will float in the liquid instead of sticking to the bottom. Organoid models, on the other hand, are more complex. For example, you can take stem cells, add the right mixture of chemicals, and get multiple different types of cells growing in a three-dimensional structure. That can be a little more representative of how they exist in your actual tissues compared to just growing on a flat surface. Anyway, one study grew human liver organoids, added various amounts of polystyrene microplastics, and analyzed the effect on the cells. They noted inflammation, disruptions in lipid metabolism, and oxidative stress, among some other negative markers. Similar studies have been done with microplastics in human airway organoids, brain organoids, and at least among the studies that get published, the results don't look too good for the organoids. However, though organoids are better than traditional cell culture in some ways, they still lack some key elements, like systemic interactions with other organs in your body, the circulatory system, immune cell activity, and certain mechanical forces. So that means these types of toxicity findings, while concerning, are not surefire evidence. Similarly, animal models have their limitations, but hint toward toxicities. One study in mice found that if you administer polystyrene microparticles, they accumulate, among other places, in the testicles, where they induce inflammation and reduce testosterone and quality of sperm. While we're on the topic of mice data with questionable relevance to humans, another mouse study found that oral administration of polystyrene microplastics to mice for eight weeks impaired learning and memory behavior. Yet other studies in mice, rats, and various types of marine life with exposure times of microplastics ranging from a few days to a few months have demonstrated accumulation of particles in the liver, among other organs, with resulting inflammation, vascular degeneration, necrosis, vasodilation, and hypertrophy seen in some animals in some of those studies. So on the one hand, the only answer in humans is that there's not high quality epidemiological evidence to show that microplastics directly cause some level of adverse effects on health. When you read this literature, it's biased toward negative findings. And maybe bias is a good word there because of course this could be some form of publication bias where provocative findings of toxicity are more likely to be written up and published compared to findings where there's no toxicities. So for me personally, I am mildly concerned enough
enough to take some actions to reduce my exposure to plastics, but I don't go overboard and freak out about it. So what can you do to reduce your exposure to microplastics if you feel so inclined? Tip number one, do not microwave foods or liquids in plastic containers. One study found that microwaving water in plastic for three minutes led to the release of millions of plastic particles. I don't think this one's too surprising. I personally never microwave anything in plastic. To me, the extra cost and hassle of switching to another container is manageable enough. Important fact, even if the container says microwave safe on the bottom, that's a lie. That does not mean it's safe for your health. It means the plastic thing itself is not going to melt or combust in the microwave. The same advice about not microwaving holds true for paper takeout containers as well. My concern there is not just for microplastics, but also for PFAS and other potential endocrine disrupting chemicals that are commonly used to make paper containers impermeant to grease and water. Tip number two, bottled water contains microplastics. So you could avoid single use plastic water bottles and find a reusable bottle that you like instead, ideally made of something other than plastic. However, studies have detected microplastics also in tap water with the amount depending exactly on where you live and the type of bottle and stuff like that. For reference though, one study estimated that if you drank only bottled water for a year, you would ingest about 90,000 microplastic particles compared to about 4,000 for tap water. So tap water is not zero, but single use plastic bottled water is just way higher. Some water purification systems can further reduce the amount of microplastics in your tap water depending on the type of system. Tip number three is to choose clothing made from natural fibers rather than synthetic fibers if you can. When you wash and dry synthetic fibers, there's physical degradation of the material which generates little plastic particles. The dryer specifically generates way more microplastics than the washing machine, so if you feel like going the extra mile, you could switch to trying to hang dry your clothing, especially your synthetic fabric clothing. Tip number four, food selection. Some research has suggested that ultra processed foods are more likely to have microplastics compared to whole foods. However, big grain of salt here, the truth of this tip will depend a lot on what exact ultra processed versus whole food you're comparing. In any event though, it's a good idea to try to add more whole foods to your diet for other health reasons anyway. Tip number five, regularly vacuum your home. If you look really closely, you'll realize that a significant portion of the dust and dirt in your home is actually microplastic particles. In addition to vacuuming, you can choose air filters for your HVAC system or standalone air purifiers that are rated to remove very, very small particles that don't just sit on your floor, but actually float in the air. The trade-off is that using those tighter mesh air filters uses more electricity to run your AC because there's more resistance to the airflow. That does bring up an important point. Almost all of these tips, especially the next one, are easier to do for people with more money. So that means there could be different risk profiles among socioeconomic lines as is custom. Tip number six, when cooking, use metal or wooden implements rather than plastic. Similarly, I personally got rid of my old non-stick cookware and switched to stainless steel pots and pans. Other good options are like cast iron, carbon steel, or 100% uncoated ceramic. Making those switches can be pricey and it's hard to quantify the exact benefit. I suspect there is one, but it's hard to say how much of it is worth it. Tip number seven, support policies aimed at reducing plastic pollution. Going forward, the only way to reduce the amount of plastic we're putting into the environment each year is to support policies aimed at reducing plastic production and pollution. I don't think the plastic making and using companies will ever make that decision on their own. Plastics are extremely inexpensive, versatile, lightweight, and strong. They have provided enormous economic, medical, and societal benefits, but now we're paying the price for it by carrying plastic particles in our water, soil, air, and blood.